Remington Bristow, a member of the VDOC Society in Philadelphia, set aside the death mask of a child and sighed in contempt. His study table appeared disorganized, with pictures of post-mortem reports, theories from investigations, and records of witnesses. The walls of his room, engulfed by the pictures of the dead child, made him feel claustrophobic. His lead the previous day to the foster home had also proved fruitless, and he wondered how long, let alone, would it even be possible to find a trace to the lineage of the unfortunate child who reminded him of his late son. In February of 1957, the Philadelphia police had encountered the case of the boy in the box. Frederick J. Benonis, a 26-year-old youth, reported the discovery of a box containing the dead body of a boy to the police. Having concealed it at first, paranoid about getting involved with local authorities, the man had only reported his find the day after, the reason being in him having watched the news broadcast on the television about a missing four-year-old girl. The police, however, found the missing girl one week later dead from starvation in an abandoned house. Investigating deeper into the case, police discovered that a muskrat hunter named John Stachowiak had discovered the dead child. It was when he was on his way to check out the trap set by him that he had discovered the box. Looking inside, he had seen the dead body of a boy, but had not reported it, being afraid of being suspected. The police had found the unidentified child in the 700 block of Susquehanna Road within Northeast Philadelphia. A bassinet resembling those sold by J.C. Penney could have been housed by the box. The culprit had wrapped the body with a blanket of inexpensive, well-worn cotton flannel, recently washed, with an additional piece inside the box, smeared with automotive grease, and a third of the piece was missing. The medical examiners assumed the boy to be white and pale between the ages of three and six, which made the police conclude that he may have been born in 1952. He stood anywhere from 3 feet to 3 feet 4 inches tall, weighing 30 pounds, and had blue eyes. His hair was light brown to sandy blonde, entangled, and seemed recently cut as clumps of it clung to his body. He was severely malnourished, body painted with scars on his ankle, groin, and chin. The medical team concluded that the boy had undergone treatment. He was covered in bruises that proved to be of physical abuse. However, the medical examination proved devoid of any broken bones. The child's right palm and soles were round and wrinkled, showing that the killer had submerged him in water around the time of death. And they concluded from the dark brown residue that he had vomited before death. The cause of death was determined to be blunt force trauma, with the four round-shaped bruises on his forehead and face drained of blood. However, his fingernails and toenails seemed to guide investigation in a direction of confusion as the child's might-be abuser neatly trimmed them, disdaining that theory. However, the arrested growth of the child strengthened their conclusion of malnutrition and abuse. It was hard to determine the time of death as it had been raining, but they could be sure that the boy had been dead just a few days to two weeks ago. The box was dry, and it had been raining in Philadelphia for the past few weeks. The Philadelphia Inquirer printed 400,000 flyers with the boy's composite image and distributed them across the area. A flyer was also included with every gas bill. Upon skimming through the crime scene, 270 policemen discovered a man's blue corduroy cap, a child's scarf, and a man's white handkerchief with the letter G in the corner. Along with the discovered commodities, they had found a strand of long brown hair that did not belong to the child. The manufacturer's insignia on the corduroy cap led the police to Robin's Bald Eagle Cap, 2603 South 7th Street, Philadelphia, Pennsylvania, whereupon they questioned Hannah Robbins and learned of a man to have custom-made the cap and purchased it with cash, leaving out any provision of trace. The serial number on the bassinet box that had contained the child allowed the police to trace it to a J.C. Penney store in Upper Darby, Pennsylvania, at 69th Street and Chestnut. They had sold it between December 5, 1956 and February 16, 1957 for $7.50. Upon searching through the records, police were successful in finding eight sales all made with cash, resulting in another dead end. The police tried to trace the blanket that had wrapped the child, however they could not pinpoint an exact buyer, 
Swannanoa, North Carolina, or Granby, Quebec, is where it was manufactured, and thousands of them had been shipped to the United States. The child was eventually buried in a potter's field in Holmesburg, Pennsylvania, next to Mechanicsville and Dunks Ferry Road. His tombstone reads, Heavenly Father, bless this unknown child. Remington Bristow took this case personally. He published a fake story in a newspaper showing that the boy had died as a result of an accident and that his loved ones hadn't been able to afford a funeral, hoping that this would coax someone out of hiding about the case, but he was unsuccessful. He also put up a $1,000 reward for information on the case and traveled across many states looking for clues. For 36 years, he worked full-time on the case, even after his retirement, until his demise in 1993. The story of the boy in the box, however, did not die down. For many years, the people of Philadelphia remembered the unfortunate child, and elapsing time triggered some theories which go on to this day. The first theory was that of a foster home located one and a half miles away from where the child was discovered, run by Arthur and Catherine Nicoletti, and Catherine's daughter from a previous marriage, Anna Maria Nagel. Remington Bristow had investigated himself and discovered a bassinet similar to the one that could have been housed in the cardboard box, and a blanket similar to the one wrapped around the child. He was convinced that the boy belonged to the stepdaughter of the man who ran the foster home, and they had disposed of a child's body in order to not expose her as an unwed mother. Despite the circumstantial pieces of evidence, the police were unsuccessful in establishing links between the boy in the box and the foster family. In February of 2002, a woman named Martha, also known as M, came to the police. She claimed that the boy, named Jonathan, had been purchased from his birth parents in the summer of 1954 by her mother. Since then, he had been subjected to extreme physical and sexual abuse. One evening at night when the boy had vomited a meal of baked beans, her mother had severely beaten him, resulting in making him unconscious. She had bathed him afterward, where he died. These details matched the police's investigation as the medical examiner had found the remains of baked beans and fingers to be water wrinkled. M's mother had cut the boy's hair accounting for the unprofessional haircut, and forced M to assist her dispose of the boy's body in the Fox Chase area. This theory corroborated with the testimony of the male who had said that the body had been placed in a box previously discarded. Despite the plausibility of M's confession, the police could not verify her story. The neighbors who had access to her house during the stated period denied the existence of any boy. M's story was plausible, but the police were wary of the history of M's mental illness. David Stout, author of The Boy in the Box, The Unsolved Case of America's Unknown Child, theorized that the boy's parents were likely poor, possibly the carnival or migrant workers who could travel without a paper trail. He supported his theory by the 1961 arrest of the carnival workers Kenneth and Irene Dudley after their seven-year-old daughter was found dead in a wooded area in Virginia wrapped in blankets with signs of abuse and malnutrition. Several of their children had gone missing, with many of them having passed away because of neglect and abuse. But the police could not trace them to the unidentified boy. In 1998, the body of the boy was exhumed for the enamel of his teeth and entered into the national and local databases. However, no hints have come from this. The boy in the box was reinterred in a grave marked America's Unknown Child in Ivy Hill Cemetery in Philadelphia, the service having garnered significant public attention. The residents, to this day, continue to decorate the grave with stuffed animals and flowers and remember the boy in the box.